The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Um, so why are we here? Uh, that's a, it's a uh, sort of rhetorical question I always ask whenever I come to uh, a bunch of Linux slash open source geeks. Um, you know, and there's, you know, some conferences I come to, they're there because it's their job and, uh, you know, they work for a living and they, you know, need to find out the latest and greatest and such and such. So, and that's fine. Um, but that's not why I'm here. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for eight years now. Uh, and in that time, I've done reasonably well for myself. I've seen Red Hat grow from, uh, from uh, the little upstart company to the, uh, you know, the Microsoft of Linux to the enterprise software company. Um, uh, why I am here, uh, and I suspect that this is true of many others as well, is that I see open source, free and open source software as a social and public good. Okay? Um, I am in a unique position uh, for which I am grateful, uh, wherein I can uh, work for a large company that pays me to sort of connect the dots between large enterprise customers who, uh, who make tons of money using our product that's based on open source, and the sort of global community that builds that software commons, right? But I live over here on this side with that global uh, community, right? That's, that's what I do for a living. Um, and the reason that I continue to do this for a living is because I get to spend most of my time on that side of the ledger, right? And that also allows me to concentrate uh, and, and hopefully with luck lead uh, the solutions to problems that matter to me, right? Um, I guess it was 2005 when I was, uh, I was in India at a conference uh, with my friend Chris Blizzard at Red Hat, and it was uh, during that conference that Chris got the word that he was going to be leading the development of uh, an operating system derivative for the One Laptop Per Child project. Um, and we're a ways down the path now with OLPC, and we see it. Uh, in hindsight, and we see a lot of the problems uh, uh, that sort of ha have plagued the OLPC project, um, and it's easy to look at those problems and not look at what it is that OLPC accomplished, and I, I, I'm going to presume that, that most of you in here are at least familiar with OLPC. If you're not, the young man there in the corner has one. That is the XO laptop. Uh, that is the, the product of the One Laptop Per Child Foundation. That cost less than $200 to manufacture. Four years ago, the notion of a laptop that would get any traction that cost less than $200 to manufacture was ridiculous, right? It simply was not something that anyone thought would ever happen. It was, oh, well, Intel's going to step in and such and such, you know, bad things are going to happen. You're going to be ground into the dust under the boot heels of Intel. And what happened was that Intel said, well, we better figure out how to make something cheap. And so they did, right? And so the opportunity for you guys to get Aces Triple E's or, you know, the, the next version of whatever, whatever it is that, that you'll be getting at some, you know, sub-notebook kind of size and price point of, you know, the $200 range is largely in part of this sort of insane vision of Nicholas Negroponte at OLPC made possible in large part by uh, uh, the existence of free software, right? Um, so I got involved with this as early as possible because, you know, I wanted to be part of the re revolution when it happened. I started writing articles for Red Hat Magazine uh, in 2006. I actually came down to South Carolina to Greenville sometime in 2006, uh, or maybe it was 2007, to actually talk about One Laptop Per Child and met a lot of folks here in South Carolina <laughs> who have actually become fairly uh, uh, instrumental in, in moving the One Laptop Per Child mission forward. Um, uh, and, and, you know, as, as time went on, it became clear that OLPC needed a more community focus, and because that's what I did at Red Hat, that's one of the things I tried to help OLPC with. Um, it, it's a funny thing. One of the worst things you can do in open source software is to get people really excited about your project 
And then when they show up to help and say, what can I do? You say, well, I'm not sure. Come back later. Right? OLPC was very guilty of that. Um, and I think it led to uh, some, some of their problems. Uh, and ultimately, it led to the creation of uh, a separate organization called Sugar Labs. And Sugar Labs is now actually the software organization uh, that carries the mission of making the software on that little device more and more awesome over time. And not only that, but making sure that that software runs not only on that EXO laptop, but on other hardware platforms as well. Uh, so uh, I work with those guys. And the reason for that is I believe in free educational materials for everybody. Right? That's what I believe in. Uh, it may be quixotic, uh, but I think less than, less than people might have once thought. And I think that OLPC is a step to that uh, uh, destination. All right? So, and if you can't see this in the back, I apologize. I'll write as big as I can in the small board I have. This is free, or I'm sorry, this is uh, where we are. This is the current educational system. And this is the brave future where we have freely available educational materials that are actually useful to students, kids, teachers, parents, everybody. And what OLPC did was move us from here to about here. <laughs> right? And one of the things that's important about OLPC is that we have learned as much from its, failure, uh, from its failures as we, as we learn from its successes. You know, its successes were considerable. But there are some other things we learned as well. One thing that we learned is that schools work a lot like factories. Um, I'm presuming you are all uh, products of the, the American educational system, most of you. You have grades 1 through 12. And those grades basically take in standard inputs and standard outputs, right? And there's one teacher who is responsible for teaching 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 kids. And uh, there's not really a lot of room for individual attention. There's not a lot of room for different learning styles. Uh, and that's simply, that's simply, that's a historical artifact, right? It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's not that teachers are bad people. It's not that administrators don't care about these kids. It's that, it's that schools are built on a 19th and 20th century industrial revolution model that predicates you build these great big cities and you put these great big schools in and you pump as many people in as you can and then you pump out citizens at the other end, right? In the industrial revolution, that was a revolutionary model. This model is what allowed us to move into the modern era and teach all of these kids, right? But we live in a different era now. We live in the era of the Internet, where this model may not be so relevant anymore, right? And this sort of begat the gigantic uh, uh, textbook publisher, who works in economies of scale. You don't write a textbook unless you're convinced that you can sell it to hundreds of school districts so that you are serving hundreds of thousands of kids. If you can't write a textbook that is going to be able to be used in a lot of these factories, you don't bother writing it at all. And so what that means is that there is a textbook industry that has a great amount of pressure uh, to, to produce the, the stuff that is going to be the most useful for the most people, right? And then on top of that, we've got this thing called No Child Left Behind, right? Are there any teachers in here? Any? Well, teachers can tell you that No Child Left Behind has been one of the most painful things for them and for kids because we are putting unreasonable pressure on a system to create results that are designed to sort of unify, un, un, make education more uniform, right? Now, schools 
before No Child Left Behind, they, they had broader objectives as well. They, they needed to get the grades, but not only did they need to get the grades, they also needed to provide kids with broader opportunities, opportunities in the arts and humanities, uh, you know, extracurricular activities of various kinds. And No Child Left Behind, which was certainly, you know, well-intentioned, had the side effect of concentrating all of those resources to passing a test, right? And any resource that wasn't directed towards passing that test had to be let go or repurposed, right? So you've seen music programs and art programs disappear, you know? Not so much from the big schools that, that, that you know, that are doing well, but from the places where some of this stuff is needed the most, the small schools, the rural schools, where these kids have few, of, few enough of these opportunities as there are, and then when you refocus the one or two foreign language teachers or, or music teachers, you know, to passing the test, these kids then have no opportunities at all to see anything other than whatever is in the No Child Left Behind path, right? Um, and the thing to understand is that this status quo is actually well described in business. It is known as the innovator's dilemma. Anyone familiar with this, Innovator's Dilemma? So it's a book by Clayton Christensen, uh, who is a professor at the Harvard Business School, and he talks about how innovation happens. Okay? Um, you've got a big business, makes a lot of money, serves a lot of customers, does a pretty good job. Let's say uh, a carriage business in the 1910s, right, the teens. Um, that's a very profitable business. You're making carriages that horses pull along. Um, you know, and if the, if, if you, the Henry Ford quote is, if I had asked the customer what he wanted, he would have asked for a faster horse. <laughs> right? Um, this is how innovation works. Somebody has a good idea that serves someone who is not in the mainstream that is being served by this market. They find some niche market and they serve the people in these niche, market, these niche markets. And those niche markets emerge to such a point and the product, which is free to innovate because it's not beholden to this entire set of customer requirements, the innovator can move quickly enough that the innovation becomes good enough for this set of people, and then the time comes where there's a great big sea change, and suddenly there are enough car factories to produce all of these automobiles that overnight make the carriage industry obsolete, right? Now, unfortunately, Detroit is going through the next version of that innovation cycle now, and it's very painful for everybody involved, and it's always very painful for everybody involved. That's the nature of innovation, right? The problem is that this is a factory, right? And this model is no longer the most efficient model. So why am I talking about this? I'm not a teacher, I'm a geek. Well, the reason I'm talking about this is because the geeks have been here before, right? Because if you take away all this, and you alter this factory a little bit, it looks suspiciously like a cathedral. Does anybody know what I mean when I say that it looks like a cathedral? So maybe some of you have read the paper, The Cathedral in the Bazaar by Eric S. Raymond. Um, in the software world, we've been here before, and we were, we were here basically first, okay? Uh, an entire industry was built up around the production of software that demanded that software had to scale in a certain way to be cost effective. It had to be built by one person who figured out all the stakeholders. It had to be built in such a way that it was sold to lots and lots of customers or it was not useful, right? Open source software and the modular nature of open source software development, which is small pieces loosely joined, has over time revolutionized the software industry to such a degree that now it is a given 
that open source software in certain circumstances does in fact produce better software than the proprietary counterparts, right? Now, it's not necessarily always true. It's not true in every case. Uh, uh, you know, there are some things that proprietary software is still better at, and that's fine. Um, so we've been here before. I think that concludes part one. Now I'm going to go get another piece of paper and read from that. <laughs> um, so if the question is how you create that disruptive force, open source software gives us some ideas about how that might work. Okay? So now we're going to talk about modularity. Modularity. Does anyone know uh, uh, the, the guidelines that Linux is built around? Anyone? We're at a Linux conference. Surely someone can tell me the standard that Linux... Uh, well, I'm talking about before that, actually. I'm talking about POSIX. That's what I'm talking about. If I had something, if I had something to throw to you, I would, you know, like a little piece of swag. Hey, there you go. But I don't have any swag. <laughs> yes, and he can give it to you. All right. <laughs> Unix started life as very proprietary stuff. Right? And one of the reasons that Unix didn't win in the marketplace was because there were all these competing Unixes that, that beat the hell out of each other and, and nothing emerged from that uh, that could stop the, the, the Microsoft beast. Um, but the nice thing about POSIX is that it was an open standard. And open standards, now that, now that we understand how open source works, we all know that open standards, truly open standards, beget open source. Right? They lead from one to the other, and it's actually one of the ways you can tell if the standard is actually open is if it leads to an open source implementation, because if it doesn't, it probably isn't as open as you think. It's either too big, too confusing, not really open, right? The ODF spec is like 20 pages, and the OOXML standard is like 300 pages or 3,000 pages or something. I, I just pulled those numbers out of my butt. But the, the, the ratio is the same, right? One standard is truly open, and, and, and you can pursue it, and the other standard is kind of crazy and wacko, and no one actually implements it, right? Ultimately, POSIX begat Linux. Um, so the question is, is there something similar in the education world? Well, there are these great things that, that that's, they're called curriculum frameworks. Right? If you go to any state in the union and you look at their educational uh, mission, they all center around curriculum frameworks. All right? And what this is, is it's a great big set of graphs that has, in this grade, these are the things that we expect you to learn. And we'll break those down into these little bullet items like you need to be able to put numbers on a number line. Right? Or you need to understand what a numerator and a denominator is. And the textbook manufacturers, you know, they work with the curriculum uh, framework folks so that they're writing content that adheres to the curriculum framework. And they actually work with the curriculum framework people to change curriculum if necessary, if, you know, because uh, these, these textbook manufacturers, they're smart people too, and they all work together and they do the best they can to give us some pretty good frameworks for doing all kinds of cool stuff. Right? These are pretty open standards. You can go to just a, like uh, uh, my favorite is the Massachusetts State uh, 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 Curriculum Framework. They've got a great website, they've, and they've got all these things in charts. You can, you can follow them. You can see what it is, if you're interested enough, that our kids are supposed to be learning from grade to grade. But here's the thing. Those curriculum frameworks do not have to be used just by textbook manufacturers who are looking to maximize their market share. They can also be used by people who are looking to build freely redistributable content by whatever means they see fit, right? And textbook manufacturers are nice people, and they're pretty smart, but they're just people like everybody else. A lot of them are very experienced, but another thing we've learned in the world of open source is that the talented amateur especially the passionate and talented amateur, can produce work 
that is every bit as effective as the work made by a 20-year professional in his field. Right? And I will diverge briefly for a story. Um, is he here? No, so I can embarrass him. Um, there's a fella uh, uh, who uh, came to the Fedora Project uh, and, and volunteered to do some wiki work, right? He loved the Fedora Project. He loved what we stood for. He showed up. He started asking what he could do. You know, uh, he noticed that the wiki was in kind of a shambles in a lot of ways because wikis are in shambles constantly because um, that's just how they are. They're entropy personified. Um, you know, and there was some there was slow performance, and this guy started to sort of dig in, and, you know, we were deciding to move our entire wiki platform from one place to another, and he started working with this fellow named Ricky, and these guys were just doing amazing work at getting our wiki ready to be cleaned up and ported over to this other platform where it would run better and be awesome for everybody. And when we asked these guys to conferences, they both said, we'll have to ask our parents, Right? Because at the time, Ricky was 16 and Ian was 15. Maybe Ricky was 17, but I'm going to say he's 16 because it, it makes the story one year better. <laughs> right? You're right. I am, oh, of course I'm right. I'm always right. Thanks, man. <laughs> right. Um, that's the world we live in. Distributed development of co code and, by extension, content uh, when you are building it in the commons for everyone to share, is one of the truest meritocracies, meritocracies that mankind has yet developed, right? There's an old New Yorker cartoon on the internet, Nobody Knows You're a Dog, right? Uh, I never really got that in the way that I get it now until I started routinely finding out that the people I was working with that I mistook for 20-year veterans of industry were in fact, you know, 16-year-old kids. There was one kid I worked with in Sugar Labs who wouldn't even tell me his name. He would just tell me his IRC nickname. And I kept asking him and saying, look, I want to I invite you to a conference. I want to send you some stuff. I've got this book that I want to send to you. He's like, I can't tell you who I am. So I came to the natural conclusion that he was a spook for the government, right? So I've got... <laughs> I've got in my head, I've got in my head this picture of this, you know, balding, you know, a lot like us. You know, mid, sort of late 30s, mid 40s, looking to do something good for the world, bored with his day job, a uh, 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 security professional. No, the reason he wasn't sharing that data with me was because he couldn't legally share it with me because of COPPA, uh, which basically uh, specifies what personal identifiable information a 12-year-old can share with the world. Right? He couldn't tell, and then he turned 13. And he's like, my name's Luke Ferrion, blah, 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 so and so, you know, and I'm 13, and I'm sorry I couldn't tell you because before I was 12, and it was illegal for me to tell you who I was. Right? That's the world of open source software, right? Not, no joke, not no exaggeration, you know, and it's, you know, it's also 60 year old professionals at the NSA. Right? The, the, Representing, right? I don't know if you're with the NSA, but thank you for raising your hand. Perfect example. Um, see, I, I love that story so much that I tell it even when it's not in the flow, and now I don't know where I am. That's okay. So the question is, if, if this standard led to Linux, what is this going to lead to? All right? What is that going to lead to? That is the question, the actionable question, that is in front of all of us right now who care about education, okay? Um, I go to the National Educational Computing Conference as often as I can. It's happening this year in D.C. in a couple of weeks. I won't be able to go because I'll be in Europe working with Sugar Labs folks, but there's a fellow named Steve Hargaden who runs a, 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 f a forum there. Basically, it's an open source forum in NEC, right? And, and NEC, the National Educational Computing Conference, is the biggest conference of teachers uh, who come and see what the latest and greatest software is out there every year. And you've got the huge proprietary software companies telling them all the greatest stuff, right? Blackboard does gigantic business there every year. And so five years ago, Steve basically fought his way in tooth and nail to get a table and a room that would seat like 30 people. And that has between doubled and tripled in size every year. And every year it's clear that the space that he has isn't big enough. 
And every year when Moodle shows up and starts, uh, 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 you know, uh, all of the teachers want to hear about Moodle, and the Blackboard folks get angry and say, there's an 8.5 by 11 printout of the name Moodle on this. That violates the policy. Take that down. All right? This is, this is the fight that we are engaged in right now. Okay? Um, so I posited that, uh, that we're heading towards the bazaar in education. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to go over what I believe the state of that bazaar is now. Okay. There are three key pieces, three key pieces Uh, that you need to think about when you're talking about educating kids. You need to have the content, right? This is the stuff you teach. And then you have activities, which is the stuff that they do to drill into their heads what you've been teaching them, and maybe the possibility for them to sort of self-direct and learn a little more. And then you have assessment. And assessment is essentially how you pass, what, did you pass the test or not? Do you know the material? Are you going to get promoted to third grade or are you going to have to come to summer school? Right? In the public schools, that's essentially what assessment is. Uh, and increasingly, it's No Child Left Behind influenced as well. So, what is freely available in the free content world for anybody to use and remix and do interesting stuff with? Well, We've got Wikipedia and all of the lesson-y stuff that goes with Wikipedia. Those guys are actually doing a pretty good job of categorizing as much of that content as they can. There's Curriki, which is a really interesting thing that uh, uh, the folks at Sun have been working on for a long time. When Scott McNeely got enough money to not have to deal with the problems of Sun anymore, one of his passions became Curriki. Uh, and He's on the board, and you know they 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 they've got a lot of these ideas as well, and they're doing their best to push teachers to develop content collaboratively on wikis to share with one another. And you know it, it's a good idea, not bad. There's a whole bunch of stuff being used on YouTube. YouTube has tons of educational material that people are just uploading. What you'll notice that's common about these things is that they are infrastructure made available that teachers basically decide to use on their own, right? There is no school board mandating you should be pulling content from here and there. They mandate the book. They mandate the curriculum. And the teachers who recognize the shortcomings of these approaches are constantly looking for new innovative ways to do things within the restrictions that, that they have to deal with. Right? And this is all uh, 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 basically infrastructure that allows them to upload their own stuff and you know, innovate. And then there's Google, right? Google is everywhere. Uh, they don't, it's not like they're trying to be a content provider. They're just where everyone goes for it, right? So, so Google. And then there's lots of stuff that is both free and not free, right? So, you know, one task is clearly uh, in front of us is to do a better job of categorizing what is free and not free, why that even matters, because educators are fairly early in this game. They don't necessarily understand why it matters to have a commons that is freely redistributable so that people can take your content and revise it and make it better. You know, a lot of teachers who sort of get the value of receiving all of this awesome free content don't yet understand what it takes to produce and make that free content better, which is essentially the, 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 the free content licensing model that, that drives software. Um, so let's move over to activities. Lots of stuff that I would describe as a meh. Um, there aren't enough computers in classrooms to have really spawned an industry here that's really all that relevant, right? And, and no real industry partner wants to get involved with this because you're not talking about going to 
the, the federal government and saying, I've got this great thing that I'd like to, uh, to put into, you know, 100,000 schools worldwide. No, they've got to talk to every one of those 100,000 school systems uh, themselves, right? It's an incredible pain in the ass. Um, if you've ever sat in one school board meeting or even watched one on TV, you don't want none of that, you know? That's crazy talk, right? And, and when we talk about... Uh, 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 an entrenched bureaucracy, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the notion of disruptive innovation. So there is a book, and, and so I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and then assessment, there's nothing free about assessment. No, sir, nothing, no thing, nada. Why is that? Because assessment is a government-run thing, right? The government's going to tell you whether your kid has passed or failed. Uh, I don't want to sound like one of those crazy uh, gun-toting libertarian types who, government's bad. Um, but the fact is that the government, for, for the public education system, this is, this is where it's at, right? And No Child Left Behind is all about this. And uh, is, is really, uh, so I'll share another brief story. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to Washington think tank folks. I was doing the, the, the tour of Inside the Beltway. And me, long hair, hippie looking me, went into the Heritage Foundation. Right? And I sat down with those guys, and they're like, so are you Mr. DeKernigsburg? And I'm like, yes, I am. Like, well, we have a meeting with you, so I guess we have to listen to what you say. Um, and we were there to talk about open source software because you know, the government gets open source software and now they're constantly trying to figure out how to change their procurement rules and how to get more use out of it and how to produce it. Lots, big chunks of the government get it and so we're trying to put together this think tank model that we can talk to all the various policy shops in DC to help them along, right? And the, th the, the reason that the heritage folks love, because it's funny, you go to the Hill and everybody, like on the political spectrum, they love open source software for different reasons, right? And the reason the heritage folks love it is because they know that money collects inefficiencies in government, right? Sometimes you need to throw a lot of money at a problem, but the more money you throw at the problem, the more you, in the more you, you create the wrong incentives and create these gigantic inefficiencies. And that's our school board, in, our, sc our school system in a nutshell. And throwing more money at it and trying to get results like No Child Left Behind does creates even more inefficiencies and just makes teachers less able to innovate, less able to do the things that they want to do, right? And the whole assessment thing is part of that. So now at the bottom here, if anyone cares sufficiently about this to do a little bit of reading after the fact, there is a book that you should read. It is called Disrupting Class. Okay? Who? Who's that? Who? Where? Yeah? Did you? Oh, you mean you've done it. You didn't read it. You've merely performed that function. All right, well. Yeah. It's, it's common kinship. That's how I ended up up here, because I was always doing that, too. Um, it's a book written by uh, one of the authors is Michael B. Horn. I always feel badly that I don't remember the second author's name. Um, but Michael B. Horn actually commented on my blog when I wrote on some of this, so that's why I remember his name, because he knows mine. Ha ha. And then the third author was Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And basically, it takes the, the, the ideas around The Innovator's Dilemma, and it puts them in the context of our educational system. All right? And so much of what I'm talking about is knowledge and wisdom gleaned directly from that book. And if you care deeply about this problem, uh, as I have come to, uh, you, should, you should take a look at that book. Uh, so having written it down, I'm now going to immediately erase it, just like a college professor. It won't be on the test. Don't worry. Huh? No, no there's no assessment here. Because I'm not the government. I can assess you, but what would it matter? So, I'll keep that up here in a little corner. Content, activity, assessment. Um, so, uh, what then does the bazaar look like? Well, we've talked about the, uh, the curriculum frameworks, right? And so, this is what a curriculum framework roughly looks like. 
Gerardo, and I, I recognize that a lot of you in the back can't see this very well, maybe, and I'm sorry for that, but this is as much for my benefit as yours, because if I'm not drawing when I'm talking, I don't know, I, I, I can't, I don't know what I think until I see what I say. So. Let us take, for example, one small corner of a curriculum framework. The one that I have chosen to think about is fourth grade math. Okay. Why fourth grade math? Why not? We've got to start somewhere. The nice thing about math curriculum is that assessment of math stuff can be pretty clear. You know, certainly more clear than uh, you know social studies. I don't know how to assess social studies. No idea. But I know enough math. I I I am as as smart as a fourth grade math student. Okay. <laughs> So I think I've got a pretty good handle on what those, what, what those skills look like, and the pedagogical stuff doesn't scare me too bad. Right? So there may be a, a, a set of these things, and on this side we've got 4.n.1, which is being able to recognize positive and negative numbers. Right? And then you've got 4n2, these are all number skills. And then you've got basic geometry skills, like 4g1, which is recognize an angle, you know, 4G2, maybe use a protractor, I don't know, I'm, you know, I don't know. The, the specifics do, do, don't matter in this case. What matters is that, that all of these things are well defined. And they are starting places for people who are interested in writing content and activities to produce something that can then be put into the commons and be useful for, for other people around the world. Right? And so as part of Sugar Labs, Sugar Labs being the, the entity that's supposed to you know, write software for the One Laptop Per Child project and, and now has moved beyond that, there's a great big mission. Teaching all of the kids of the world is a great big mission. And it involves, you know, another thing, all this stuff is in English right now. The vast majority of content on the internet is in English. And because the licenses of that stuff are unclear, it's unclear whether people in other countries have the rights to translate that content, right? And localization of educational content is one of the big sort of green fields, you know, because the chances are that the people who figure out this model first are not necessarily going to be us. Remember the underserved market idea? There's a reason that Negroponte didn't bring the OLPC to South Carolina first, right? He didn't bring it to anywhere in the United States first. He took it overseas first because he knew that their bureaucracy would be significantly less entrenched than our gigantic old bureaucracy. I think that was his hope. I think in reality there was more entrenchment there than he suspected. <laughs> uh, but he still managed to get a million of those bad boys deployed in Uruguay and Peru and you know, handfuls of you know, Nigeria and small pilot projects elsewhere. And it was the success of those pilots that ended up having uh, a, a case to sell 25,000 of these units to South Carolina uh, uh, to, you know, to, see, to see what we could do with them. Um, so bear in mind that this is all already being done in the form of a textbook. But the limitation of a textbook is that, first of all, it's dead treeware. It's very expensive to produce all that stuff, so you have to have economies of scale that allow you to ship that, across, print a bunch of them, sell them to the schools. Schools have to pay a, a ton of money to get these things produced, right? Um, so that's a problem. This stuff can all be digital, right? Which there's still a cost to produce all this stuff, right? As, as much as I love being a free Linux hippie guy, people need to eat, people got to pay their rent. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the, that the economic model has to stay the same, right? This stuff that is currently being produced in textbooks can just as easily be, be, be created in digital format and put into the hands of kids if only the kids have the opportunity to actually use that digital stuff in an unencumbered way, right? Kid has to be able to use it at, uh, at school. Kid has to be able to use it at home that one of the ideas behind the EXO was that it needed to belong to the student so that it didn't end up locked up in a lab somewhere at the end of the day. If the student owned the unit, the student would take the learning with them, right? There wouldn't be a digital divide problem because the student would own the laptop, and the cost of a kid breaking or destroying a laptop or whatever 
was, you know, was conceived as being a cost that you could bear when you compared it to the cost of producing and maintaining textbooks year after year after year, right? But there still needs to be content that is available on these computers, and that's where we're blocking now, right? And that's one of the problems that the EXO project has, and one of the reasons that they have shifted their focus uh, uh, to, you know, now that they've sort of solved the hardware problem, they're now looking more at the content problem, making sure that there is content widely available. So that's the C piece, the content piece. But the activity piece on a computer requires geeks, all right? You got to have geeks to write code. And there's this sort of disconnect between the, 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 the world of helpful geeks and the world of excited teachers, because teachers love this vision. They're like, that's awesome. I would love to have more uh, 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 tools. Uh, g give me activities that are awesome. And a developer says, OK, here's this thing I wrote that's a maze thing. And, and, and the teacher says, well, how does that connect to anything I actually do? And the geek says, well, I don't know. I just wrote a maze. I thought it was cool. I thought kids would like it. <laughs> Here you go. You know? Um, so this is why fourth grade math exists, right? To sort of bridge this divide in one small test case. Um, so if you go to sugarlabs.org, there's a fourth grade math section of the site where we've spelled out one of these. I happen to choose the Massachusetts fourth grade math curriculum. We've got this whole table mapped out. And so there's a, there's a column here that tells you what, the, what the, the, the learning objective is. And now it's a wiki, and wikis are a mess, and it's evolving slowly. But it's moving, and there are actually contributors in this room who are working on it. Now over here, there are some people who are saying, you know what? I'm going to work on this problem. So um, I'll just pick David Nally, even though I don't, I don't think you're actually working on activity. You're just driving everyone else to work on activities. Um, I'll write an activity. Right? And I'm working on this thing called Dungeons of Mongo. Right? Dungeons of Mongo. And it's, you know, it's going to first attack some piece in the, you know, when I have time to finish it. Um, so uh, more reasons why this is interesting and useful. First of all, once you write one of these activities it's, and you put it out under an open, uh, an open license, it is the world's to keep, right? It doesn't get lost. It doesn't turn into uh, you know, a first printing that's superseded by a second printing that's superseded by a third printing, and the first two printings end up at a landfill. The digital commons, if you manage it as you're supposed to manage it, this stuff is forever. And if it is open and can be shared, this activity begets other activities that can use it as a base. That is one of the strengths of open source software, right? Um, and the thing is that this is true even for, for projects that are basically fail, right? Because the great thing about open source software is that in every failure, there is still the seed of rebirth, right? Whoever thought that Firefox was going to become a, a, a dominant player in the, in the web browser world again, you know? Seven or eight years ago, you may have had faith, sir. Um, <laughs> But it, it took a true believer back then to believe that IE hadn't basically just crushed uh, Netscape forever and ever, right? But because the code was open and because there were people committed to making it better, it evolved into something that became, you know, it would be the market leader if Microsoft wasn't pre-shipping IE on everything in sight. But, but Firefox has a 15% market share and it's, and it's, it's, what? It's, it's got a 30% market share when it is preloaded, you know? People have to go get it. It's so awesome. They're like, I got to go get it. I need tab completion. I need this. I need all this. I need the ad block. I need all this stuff that IE doesn't do because IE is still written by the same team of engineers going, boy, they're moving really fast. Right? But the problem is you have to get to a critical mass to get there, right? And so fourth grade math, we need to still figure out how to get to critical mass. This one activity might be set for a learning style, uh, someone who reads, right? I'm a reader. I'm a visual learning guy. And this is something that, that educators think about a lot. Learning styles is one of those things that all educators understand that they need to cater to, but have absolutely no tools to do it because of the nature of, of the way schools work. 
They've got 30 kids. They've only got basically time to teach what's in the textbook. And they see all of these opportunities that, gee whiz, they wish they could do something about. But there's only so many hours in a day. And there's 30 kids. Those 30 kids need educating. If one kid is an auditory learner and another kid is like a, a kinesthetic learn, like learns by touch and, and manipulating things, there's absolutely nothing that the teacher can do for that kid, right? But if there are activities that can be built to, to satisfy those different learning styles, right? Over time, this will grow into something that is useful. And we have to figure out how to get over that hump, okay? Oh, I had a good thing I was going to next. Oh, uh, one more thing is assessment. Um, because a class basically has its beginning and its middle and its end, and that beginning, middle, and end are the exact same thing for every kid, then you have to try to educate every kid along the exact same path. But the fact is that an education doesn't necessarily need to follow that path. It only follows that path because that is the only way that schools are currently constructed to handle. Okay? Because the grade of first through 12, or, or I'm sorry, let, let me say that again. The, the lessons in the fourth grade all need to be taught in a certain order because you need to know certain things before certain other things. But that doesn't mean they all have to be taught at the same speed, the same way. The only thing you need to know is whether the kid knows the thing before so we can go on to the next thing. When it comes to educating, progressions are the only thing that matter in that way, to know whether they've done this thing so that they can move on to this other thing. And that's why assessment is one of the key pieces that, that, that we need to figure out. Right? So you can imagine instead of being like this structure where this lesson leads to this lesson leads to this lesson leads to this lesson, and if this kid gets stuck here, maybe he gets tutoring, maybe he goes to a Sylvan Learning Center because his family has the money to pay for it, or maybe he ends up working at Burger King. Right? Because there was just no energy to get this kid over the hump and no tools for that kid to help himself get over the hump. Right? What if instead of looking like this, it is a tree with lots of individual modules with self-directed learning and all these kinds of things. You know, where do we see that now? Does anyone watch TV here? Anyone? Yeah? You're lying. You all watch TV. <laughs> uh, are we familiar with Rosetta Stone? Those guys are just printing money right now, right? And the reason they're doing it is because they are tapping an underserved market, a market of learners who want to learn a language um, and don't have the capacity to find any local teachers to teach them that language, right? In high schools, we have exactly the same scenario. If you're a kid who goes to high school in Greer, South Carolina, you maybe have Spanish and French as a foreign language option. You may have another one. You may not even have those two, you know? You may have Latin because, you know, you've got a 50-year-old professor who won't let it go. <laughs> right? It's the root of the other two. <laughs> and, and it is the root of the other two, and he continues to make that point, and everyone says, all right, yes, we'll keep Latin. <laughs> um, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. There is absolutely no reason, no reason at all, why a kid in Greer, South Carolina, shouldn't be able to go to a lab somewhere in his school and learn Arabic, either taking something like Rosetta Stone or taking it online, right? There's no reason at all. The reason is because there's not a teacher to teach them, right? So the future... I believe, and I think we're starting to see this, and it is part of the premise of the book Disrupting Class, go, go if you care about this stuff, go read it, is figuring out how to make these kinds of modules of learning that can be taught independently or over the internet as part of some coordinated learning effort. Right? And the problem with this is that there's not necessarily a local teacher who knows this content. Right? We have drilled it into teachers that, I've got 30 seconds, that teachers must know everything. Right? In this model, teachers may not know everything. Right? We've got teachers that may have to be uh, learning advisors or, or, or sort of learning tutors, right? which requires a change that our system isn't able to do. Right? Where are the underserved markets? The under the, they're, they're home schools. They're after-school programs like, uh, uh, like Sylvan. Right? They are uh, charter schools. 
All right? If we can construct something like this for those underserved markets, we have the possibility of creating a commons of knowledge using open source and free content that can serve uh, not only our kids, but the kids in the entire world. And I wish I had time for questions, but maybe I don't. Or I guess I do. I don't know. Do I t Who held up the sign? Do we have time for questions, if there are any? Are there any questions? How do you, how do you see the progress? How do we see? Yeah, no. What do you think? We're going slowly, right? There are some things that we need to figure out that underlie all of these things, like assessment. We don't even have an API for assessment. There are some very simple things we can do for assessment. One of the things that teachers want to know, how long is a kid spending on an activity? Yeah. That single thing is as predictive, if not more predictive in many cases, than an actual grade as to actual knowledge of the activity. So time, you, could, you could have time as the single assessment factor right now, and we don't even have an API that includes that in sugar, right? So we continue to work towards those kind of things. I'm, do, I'm at a conference in Berlin next week. I'm going to be sitting down with the core sugar developers to talk about some of these things. Um, one last thing. My email address is gdk, gdk at redhat.com. If you are interested, please email me. And I wish I had more time, but I don't, so... Great. Thanks. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.